Thank you again all so much for coming out. Uh, we are excited and honored to be hosting your speaker tonight. She is a neuroscientist and a nutritionist. Uh, I think we can all agree this is an incredible combination and very rare. <laughs> Don't see that very often. So she complements nutrition and neuroscience making an amazing pair for helping people understand the connection between what they eat, how they feel, and form. She's the founder of Neurotrition, based out of Calgary, Alberta, Alberta uh, which is the company that is at the forefront of what she likes to call the brain food revolution. So without further ado, please help me welcome Thank in. you, Lynn. Welcome, Orson. <laughs> Thank you so friend. much. Wow, good evening. I'm super honored and I'm humbled to be here. I've been on a little bit of a Western Canada tour and this is my fourth stop. I'm from BC, so super happy to be back home, obviously. Turn it down. Which way's down? Is that better or worse? Yeah. Worse? No, it's better. <laughs> okay, just let me know if the volume gets too intense or too quiet and I can play around. Okay. So yeah, I'm really, really excited to be here and thank you to the wonderful team who is hosting me tonight and thank you to the wonderful company that sponsored me to be here, Botanica, Charity from Botanica is here uh, tonight as is Jen downstairs because not only is this packed up here, we've got downstairs going as well as Facebook Live. So we've got some Botanica people up here downstairs and uh, it's just been so great to get an opportunity to travel around and talk about what I'm so clearly, you'll see the passion, um, which is gut and brain health. I uh, started off very, very Western, very allopathic. I went through the psychiatric program at UBC. I specialized in neuro, hardcore, hardcore, meds, meds, meds for brain and mental health until one day I just had a gut feeling, which is hilarious that now I work with the gut. <laughs> Strange how that how kind of happens. But one day in 2008, I remember sitting and I remember Ritalin hitting the scene. The Ritalin had been around for a while, but it just kind of like took off. Um, around that time point and I remember my profs all saying like this is it this is the solution to kids brain and mental health this is what we're going to put every kid on and something in me just snapped I'm like I'm not ever going to do this like what am I going to do with my life though I just put in 11 years hard for getting my training and then I'm like going to walk away from my education so rather than doing that I went home and I googled nutrition I knew nothing about nutrition but I ended up enrolling, like within a week, they let me enroll late at the Canadian School of Natural Nutrition in Vancouver. So during the day, in 2008 and 9, I was still at UBC during the day, at CSNN during night, and then in the middle I had a little job at the farmer's market, because they would let me study while I was working. <laughs> they were really lax, so that's where I worked. And it was a brutal year, but at the end of it, it culminated in the launch of my baby, Neurotrition. Uh, it's a fake word. Some people ask me, like, oh, I've never heard that word before. Well, it's made up. Um, my, husband, my husband actually coined it. Um, my company was nameless for its first year of life. But it's the combination of my loves, neuroscience and nutrition. And so we're in our seventh year, and we aim, I've got a team, it's not just me anymore. There's 13, or no, there's 16 of us. And uh, we work to go beyond the band-aid. Like my motto is just ripping off that band-aid that we pretend to help people's brain and mental health with and going so far beyond it using an integrative approach. Uh, I'm not against medication. Some of our really, really sick patients will always need their medications, but I'm about optimizing them and about finding usually a lower dose where the person's not a zombie and they're not kind of like sick with liver toxicity effects. So it's just an integrative approach that I feel is needed. And we're the only company of its kind in Canada, and I just really want more people to get into this field. So yeah, without further ado, here I am. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> We've got a super cool giveaway that I want to start tonight's talk off with from my lovely partners, uh, Botanica. So what you need to do is take a flattering photo, either of me or one of my slides, and uh, share it online. Then follow us. If you are on social media, follow at Botanica Health and follow at Neurotrition on either Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Tag us in the photo and use the hashtags that Botanica has created for tonight, hashtag Botanica Health, and hashtag Mindful Living in the Post. And in about a week's time, I get to choose a winner of a really wonderful prize pack that will contain all the products I'll be touching upon tonight that I love and that all our clients are on at Neurotrition. So if you're on social, get on that. We're also going to have three opportunities to win one of the products tonight. Um, 
with different pop quizzes. So be on your A game. Don't fall asleep during my talk. First hand up, you'll get an opportunity to, to win. So let's begin. The only other note before I start this talk is that I don't want or need you, unless you want to, to be taking notes tonight. Because what I've created for this tour is a really nice, robust handout package that contains much, much more than even what's on my slides. It also contains a bunch of scientific references and literature if you want to know more about the topics that I'll be going into tonight. So you can sit back and you can relax. And those will be available. I'll give you the link on the very last slide. They'll be available to print as a PDF on Botanica's website. And then the final note is I love questions. And um, we're going to do a really thorough Q&A period at the end. I would ask if you don't mind that you hold your questions until the end, because I don't want to feel rushed in answering them. I want to give each question the respect and time it deserves. So if you don't mind, we'll do a nice, thorough, solid Q&A at the end. So, I mean, yeah, I was a neuroscientist for 11 years, and uh, I was pretty confident, bordering on arrogance. Um, I'm not going to lie, I was confident. I'm like, I know the brain. I knew the brain. And it was very, very uh, humbling when I quite aggressively got knocked off my pedestal because I started to learn about something called the gut. After 11 years in medical training, Western training, I, we knew about it, like we knew about the colon and the intestinal tract, but we never learned that potentially gut health may be related to mental health. That was news to me, and uh, yeah, it knocked me on my butt pretty hard. And um, I was upset for a little while. I felt quite stupid. I'm like, oh no, I didn't know about the second brain. But now what I've done is kind of turn that feeling into wanting to educate the masses. And that's what I really do is I get out there and I do a lot of public speaking on the gut-brain connection. And that's what we'll be covering tonight. You guys excited? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Don't say no. <laughs> get out. Get out. So I'm really proud that these days the gut stands really proudly with the brain and all of our clients' uh, prescriptions. We call it the Neurotrition Rx. And what this means is we work as an adjunct to psychiatric care or naturopathic mm -hmm. care. So all our clients do have to have a physician or a naturopathic physician um, of some sort. And our prescription helps complement their medical prescription. So we work with diet, we do work with some good supplements. And then, of course, lifestyle modalities. And we'll be covering all those types of things tonight in five key rituals that form the fundamental, the core of our Neurotrition Rx for brain and mental health. So about half the talk will be science, and about half the talk will be the toolkit, the five rituals. And it'll still be pretty science-y, so I hope you guys are, are up for that. And the reason that you know our Neurotrition Rx needs to include the gut when we're talking about brain and mental health is because look at how many things it influences and this is all science based so if you dig into the references that um, are part of the handouts that will be made available to you on Botanica's site you'll see the gut influences how we feel, how we think and how we behave. Here are some of the most common conditions that people in our part of the world are dealing with. We struggle, many of us, with poor memory, we struggle with brain fog, uh, poor concentration, high stress. Most specifically, um, what I mean by high stress is an inability to deal with stress, an inability to just kind of cope with it in an adaptive way. We freak out. Um, depression and anxiety, we work with a lot at neurotrition, <coughs> at fatigue, and the most common issue that people are not seeking medical help for uh, is insomnia. Science tells us that insomnia underlies all of these conditions. 50% of people struggle with it, and out of that 50%, only 25 seek help. People are just like, yeah, you don't sleep either, I don't either, so it's normal. Well, it's not normal. Look at all the other things that it's related to. And now we have evidence to suggest your gut has something to do with all these conditions. So it's scary, but also it offers hope because maybe we can address these really common things that make us feel unwell and be unhappy in our lives by addressing the gut. Gut bugs for life 
I know, it's so cute. I wish I could say I added these photos, but you're going to see some really cool photos and images throughout, and those are from Botanica. So they took my somewhat dry, somewhat science-y slides, and they infused some flavor and some life into them. So thank you, Charity, uh, for those. And especially, this is my favorite image, <laughs> the little baby. The first thing I want to really teach you guys is that we have our gut bugs for life and they influence our brain and mental health throughout our entire lives, starting with when we're born. So you may have heard that the very first time that we even acquire our gut bugs or a microbiome is when we're being born. In fact, about five, six years ago, scientists discovered that babies acquire their entire microbiome through a natural or a vaginal birth. So babies that are born by a C-section, they're at a bit of a loss in terms of their microbiome. So since this research has been out for about the last six years, a lot of my more educated, I would say cooler, younger, I don't know what the word is, but a lot of the doctors that I'm friends with are now doing a quick swab of mom, putting it in baby's mouth, and that C-section baby is like a vaginally birth born baby, you know? But I like to educate doctors, like, please do this. It takes two seconds, and it helps that C-section baby get their microbiome. But again, this is newer research, so some of the doctors that are still using their books from the 50s aren't up to speed on that yet. Some of my profs are like, what is this? Well, you should be doing it. Um, because what we see in a C-section baby in terms of what their microbiome looks like, it looks like the gut bugs that live on the nurse's or the midwife's hand, or even the gut bugs found somehow randomly stuck to the wall of the birthing environment because there are gut bugs somehow that end up in our environment too. And that's what it looks like. So we want that baby, um, if, if he or she is born by a C-section, to acquire the microbiome of the mom. The second period in early life where we see the microbiome being really affected is by a baby either being breastfed or bottle fed. And of course, you all probably know that the good one is breastfeeding. The baby's microbiome starts to flourish and starts to grow such a beautiful, healthy, healthier gut garden that is then linked to better brain and mental health as the kid grows up. The other thing we start to see, and this is really interesting, science tells us at about age three, in fact, so toddlers, we see that stress and or high dose of antibiotics, either intravenously or orally, can really kill the little child's microbiome. So much so, in fact, that high stress or antibiotics prior to age three is significantly correlated to autism spectrum disorder. So this isn't a causation, okay? So the first thing people get confused by, and as a scientist, I always feel like I have to kind of give a, kind of break it down, is a causation is different than a correlation. So when I say correlation, there's a link there. There's some going on. You kill your microbiome before age three, there's a relationship to potentially developing autism. But that doesn't mean that if you, you know, give your kid antibiotics or they're super stressed or trauma happens to them, that they're gonna become autistic. It's just there's a correlation that some of my colleagues that are starting to tease apart. Adolescence is kind of a weird time, huh? It's kind of like fading in my memory, but I still remember it some days. Adolescence is a weird period uh, in the brain. It's development, and it's where a lot of brutal disorders tend to rear their ugly heads, and I see this a lot at neurotrition. In adolescence, we first see things like schizophrenia around age 16, 18. We see things like bipolar disorder. And in the gut world, it's during adolescence where we see Crohn's typically first present, colitis, and IBS. So there's something going on in adolescence. So perhaps, and some of my researcher uh, colleagues in Europe are studying, could we really approach and have positive impact on a teenager's microbiome and maybe, just maybe, prevent some of these bad things from expressing? And maybe we could. And there's research currently being done on that. Then, you know, full life circle, we start to get old, we start to age. And research tells us about age 60. I don't think age 60 is old, this is just not me. I'm like not taking blame. This is what the science says, is 60. At around age 60, we see this weird bloom, or diversification we call it, in the gut flora. And usually diversity is good, but in the case of your gut microbiome sometimes, when it diversifies, a lot of bad gut bugs also form. So we see this with age 60. We don't know why. Even in healthy individuals, just randomly, more bad gut bugs tend to be born and grow. 
correlated, so linked to this, we see in those age 60 and up a massive increase in inflammation in both their gut, even in otherwise healthy populations, and in the brain. And then corresponding to that, we start to see damage of brain cells in a very specific part of the brain that we'll talk about closer to the end of the workshop called the hippocampus. This is the part of the brain that shrinks and breaks down in dementia and Alzheimer's. So we see this start to occur around age 60. So again, some colleagues of mine are looking at aging populations and preclinically aging rodents and trying to figure out like, can we fix aging individuals' microbiomes and prevent some of those hardcore things like Alzheimer's disease. Be wonderful. Your gut garden, I mean, this is a bit of a review because I heard the crowd in here tonight is super smart, but I always, I need, I need a review, I need a repeat slide. I've been in a lot of cities, some people don't yet know about the gut garden and that's okay. When I talk about the microbiome, literally what it is, is a bunch of different bugs living in your intestinal tract. There's about 40,000 different species that live down there. Yeah, I know, it's a lot. And this is the real kicker. There's 10 times as many of them residing in here as there are cells in your body and brain, okay? So there's a lot of them, they're important, and again, we didn't, I didn't certainly know about them. Last night at my talk in Vancouver, someone said, I've known about this for 20 years. I'm like, I've only known for seven. <laughs> I've only known for seven, I'm sorry. So maybe you guys have known about this stuff, but to us scientists, sorry about that, this is really, really new. And we now know that the, your microbiome or microbiota interacts with the rest of your body and bodily functions. And again, this might be common knowledge to you, but to us, this really only kind of took off in the last five, six years with the advent of things like brain imaging, where people can actually scan your brain, scan your gut, and see like, whoa, they're somehow connected. So to us, it's like dumb scientists, like it's new. <laughs> so, and one of the things that, of course, the gut talks to, and we're gonna be the whole topic of tonight, is it talks to your brain. And their love story is bi-directional. What that means is the brain loves to talk to the gut, and the gut also loves to talk to the brain. So it's kind of 50-50. <laughs> and it's so funny actually before I get to the pop quiz it's so funny that this is so new in my mind that it just like knocked me hard on my butt seven years ago when I realized this but when I look back to even how I've been talking since I was a kid like think of the common things we all say I have a gut feeling mm -hmm. Duh. like do you know what I mean yeah. it takes guts to stand up for yourself like this has been infused into our vernacular forever yet it still is like shocking to me <laughs> every time I talk about this I'm like still shocked but in other cultures and even how we speak it's there trust your like gut it's, it's yeah yeah <laughs> time for the first pop quiz First hand up, which life in, which life stages are influenced by the gut bugs? <laughs> yes. Amazing. Amazing. So you're going to win the Dr. Aviator's probiotic, my favorite. I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. Super good product. Pleasure. Pleasure. Now, how does the gut talk to the brain? Because we all hear this. The gut and the brain talk. So I'm going to give you a little crash course uh, to, to teach you. There are five ways that the gut talks to the brain. The first, and they're equally cool, so I don't have a favorite. They're in no particular order. But uh, the first way that the gut and the brain love to chat is through the immune system. Have you guys heard that before? Through immune responses. And specifically, we see a couple things. We see that some of the healthy, happy species uh, of bugs living in your intestinal tract increase anti-inflammatory molecules in your bloodstream, in your, where your immune system lives. For those of us who are more scientifically or nerdily inclined, they increase interleukins, and specifically interleukin 10. This is a really potent inflammation calming molecule in your bloodstream. So the healthy gut bugs naturally raise that. Other healthy species of gut bugs are shown under massive magnification under a microscope. They actually stand in and act as a physical shield or barrier and prevent toxins from slipping past through the gut or even through the blood-brain barrier. So yeah, these gut bugs are definitely working for us through immune responses. 
A second way uh, that recently actually the gut was found to talk to the brain was through a special nerve called the vagus nerve or vagal nerve. And this nerve lives in your peripheral nervous system, so those are the nerves kind of shooting off your spinal cord. And this vagus nerve, um, you would never have to think about it unless you have a disease of the vagus nerve, in which case you'd be very sick and thinking about it. But the vagus nerve controls things that you are not usually consciously aware of, like your heart rate or your gut motility, you know, you're not like obsessive hopefully of like, you know, things moving through you. The vagus nerve takes care of that. But randomly, serendipitously, a few years ago, uh, one of the scientists in this field decided, let's try and stimulate it in a rodent, preclinical. Um, so some of the stuff I'll be talking about tonight is preclinical, others clinical, already in humans. So I'll be kind of going between both. He stimulated it randomly. And guess what happened? Anti-inflammatory compounds flooded these animals' bloodstreams just by stimulating this vagal nerve. So then he's like, okay. Then he had to go get special ethics. Um, and then it took, it took a few years because the second thing he did, he sniffed, this, he sniffed it. He sniffed the vagus nerve and he gave the rodents a bunch of probiotics. And guess what happened when the vagus nerve was snipped? Zero effect. The probiotics couldn't work. So scientists think like maybe one way that probiotics are helping us is through this weird vagal nerve that we have uh, coursing off our spinal cord. Short chain fatty acids, SCFAs, these are cool. You probably haven't heard of them, so if this is your first time, hopefully you're wowed by them, because I am. Short chain fatty acids are one of the things that your gut bugs actually poop out. It's one of their byproducts that comes out of them when they eat prebiotics, which we'll talk about tonight, the food that they eat. They metabolize it, digest it, and eliminate it. And short chain fatty acids are starting to be found to be related to things like our weight. Some short chain fatty acids, so some poop of gut bugs, helps us stay slim. Others promote weight gain or obesity. Some of these gut bug poops tell us that we're full. Other ones tell us you're not full, keep eating, you're hungry. So depending on which species of gut bugs are going on down there, they may be feeding into our ability to you know, recognize true hunger or eat emotionally. And then that maps onto things like weight. So this is huge, right? Because everyone's searching for that answer to weight or that answer to emotional eating. Like we all deal with it and it's devastating and can really spiral. Um, out of control for many people, but maybe, just maybe, gut bugs have something to do with it. The enteric nervous system. This is the scientific, nerdy word for your gut is your second brain. This is what someone like me thinks of. It's called enteric nervous system. And this is a collection of brain cells that lives inside your gut. And what's really cool about the enteric nervous system, um, and this was really, this was for me the final moment that I'm like, I have been knocked on my butt. I am officially humbled. Is your enteric nervous system makes as many, if not more, neurotransmitters than your brain. And not just serotonin, which you've all heard of, but other cool ones like dopamine, which I spent my entire master's degree studying. Dopamine helps us have motivation and helps us have drive and passion. Uh, dopamine also, outside of your brain, in your body, when it goes away, contributes to things like Parkinson's disease. So dopamine does different things in the brain versus the periphery. Um, the enteric nervous system makes GABA, which is our calming anti-anxiety neurotransmitter, and it also makes acetylcholine. That's the one that goes away in dementia disorders and Alzheimer's disease. So it, your gut is making all of these neurotransmitters, just like the brain, and specifically one of them that it makes readily is the precursor to serotonin, this amino acid tryptophan. So yeah, you can take these supplementally or you can learn to feed your gut and it makes all this stuff for your brain on its own if it's healthy, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of my one. Now, as with any relationship, guys, you know what happens when communication goes down? our relationship's not gonna last or it's gonna be strained, okay? <laughs> it goes for people and it goes for the gut and the brain. When communication breaks down, you're heading towards disaster. Two things happen. You develop something called leaky gut. Have you guys heard of this? Okay, so it's really funny. This is again one of those things that I just like shake my head at my medical colleagues. Up until about five, maybe six years ago, most of my colleagues in the Western medical field thought this condition was a joke, right? So then they started doing research, they found out, oops, it's real, but most of them still won't call it this. Like even when I'm having conversations with my colleagues who sit on my uh, nutrition, we've got a scientific advisory board, so these big wigs, 
um, individuals and I have, you know, regular talks, and you know what they call it? They will not say leaky gut. They call it porous bowel syndrome, <laughs> or they call it intestinal permeability syndrome. I'm like, you're talking leaky gut. They're like, no, it's the same damn thing. They're talking about leaky gut. That's one thing that can go awry when even one of these five things malfunction. So this is serious. <coughs> and then the other thing we're starting to see is when one or more of those five um, ways that the gut and brain talk to one another goes away is the blood brain barrier also becomes porous or permeable, leaky brain, and that's scary. That's really scary because then things that the blood brain barrier should keep out go into the brain. A few examples of things that go into a leaky brain when your microbiome is imbalanced include MSG. That sucks because MSG a couple years ago was found to mess with your hunger cues. So when you eat MSG, you don't know when you're full. So you keep eating that cheap takeout, right? It's actually not your fault, but it's the MSG. Another thing that makes it through a leaky brain that shouldn't are things like aspartame, pesticides, certain fungicides make it through. Like this is just bad news in terms of then your later in life, mental health and brain health, when stuff is getting in that should be uh, kept out. I worry about leaky gut because I'm starting to believe that it could be one cause potentially of adult onset allergies and of autoimmune disease. Autoimmune diseases are on the rise and I do see a significant link to leaky gut and back to microbiome. Now is there a pill for it? I wish. I'm medical so I just wish that there was a pill but there isn't. And leaky gut doesn't happen overnight. I believe it takes a while until you fully get hit with the full syndrome. Um, so there's no pill, but the five rituals we're gonna be talking about are at the core of how we at Nutrition work with it. Do I need probiotics? This is something that I get asked so often. So the way that I want to teach you about do I need probiotics is first I wanna talk about you if you have a healthy brain and whether you need them or not. And then I want to talk about you if you have a sick brain and you know what brain sickness is. Is the science telling us probiotics can help with? So if you're healthy, here's the three areas that science has told us pretty nicely over the last couple years that probiotics can in fact help you with. They can help improve your mood, they can help improve your stress, and they can help improve your energy. A couple examples from studies with mood, they gave people as little as four weeks so the good quality probiotics that I support that I'll be talking about tonight, it doesn't take years. Like, it is such a pet peeve of mine when some of my clients, or I hear this, they're like, yeah, I've been going to this or this person, I've been seeing this naturopath for three years, but this is the year my stuff's going to kick in. I'm like, no, when something's a good product, it will kick in. And the science says that when it's these good quality probiotics, it kicks in in as little as four weeks. So it's not about like third year with this practitioner is gonna be it, four weeks. And that's when we start seeing results as well with our clients. With mood, they give people four weeks of probiotic therapy um, and then they put them in a scanner and show them things like scary faces or you know aggressive faces. Their stress response is blunted. They're not as freaked out by them. And they report better mood. They report, this is all subjective, but you know self-report, less distress, but that's good. People are feeling overall better mood. Then we look at some of the physiological markers. Four weeks of a good quality probiotic. Less cortisol, that's our main stress hormone. Less cortisol in your pee. That means you're making less if you're peeing out less. Then we look at people's blood work. Less cort flying around in their bloodstream. Again, telling us, wow, people after as little as a month of this stuff have less stress hormone circulating around their body. So that's a really, really good thing. And then energy, again, we just measure. Some of the studies I was reading look at college kids during exam period. They have more energy. They're less fatigued, aging people. This one, these studies were like eight weeks, so it takes a bit longer, two months of probiotic therapy it helps with um, fatigue and energy. In terms of when you should take it, the research kind of falls into two camps, and I've read a lot of it, and they don't agree. One camp says take your probiotic with food especially with something that contains fat or protein to help carry it into the cells. And then the other camp totally disagrees with that and says you should take it on an empty stomach. So I always say like, okay, when things disagree, just like forge your own path. So <laughs> we tell clients just to take it before bed. And the rationale behind that is just let your body do what it needs to do at night. Hopefully you're in a relaxed state, hopefully you're sleeping once you get the insomnia under control and uh, you're able to utilize that probiotic. 
So that's how our clients get their probiotic before bed. The one thing that all of the science agrees on, please do not take your probiotic with a hot beverage. Okay? So yeah, it is shown to kill off um, quite a bit of those little bugs. Yeah. Having said that, and this is one of the cool things, I'm jumping ahead, but I'll be talking about O'Hara's probiotic tonight. It's super cool because the supplement exposes their gut bugs over like three to five years. It takes a long time to super hot heat already and super cold cold. So what ends up staying in your capsule has kind of like weathered the storm, but that's unusual, but that's cool, right? So that one you could take um, with something warmer or something colder, but your standard cheap probiotic, you need to be so careful. So. A little bit of a, a summary slide here. Pro probiotics reduce cort, boost serotonin, help people elevate their mood, and reduce fatigue. Prebiotics are kind of new on the scene. Um, prebiotics have just really started being studied a couple of years ago, two, three years ago. So far though, it's really promising because already we're seeing prebiotic therapy helps uh, alleviate risk factors for both anxiety and depression. So this is awesome. So we'll talk about probiotics, prebiotics, as two of our rituals. Okay, this is not a fake word, I promise. Psychobiotics. Have you guys heard of it before? Okay. Psychobiotics was coined two years ago by one of my colleagues at, at the University of Cork in Ireland, Dr. John Cryan. He's super cool, C-R-Y-A-N. He's all over TED Talks. He's like one of those rare neuroscientists that actually is like cool. And, uh, <laughs> and can uh, just talk to the public, and that's rare, and he's one of these people, and psychobiotics is a really kind of sexy word, and what it refers to is probiotics and prebiotics together to help people's mental health. And I love it, and I love using this word because it really embodies neurofission's approach to mental health. It's like going beyond the band-aid, like let's finally start looking at what is the root cause instead of trying to just band-aid people's symptoms, but they're still there when you stop taking a med. It like floods back, you know what I mean? So yeah, psychobiotics hopefully is, uh, helps form some of the future in psychiatric care. I call it nutritional psychiatry, but uh, yeah. Okay, so that was kind of a crash course on probiotics for your brain if it's healthy. But you just want it to be a little bit better mood, a little bit lower stress and a little bit better energy. But what if your brain's sick? When do you need probiotics? Here is where the research is at so far clinically. That means it's already past the preclinical rodent stage and into the clinical human stage. So this has quite a bit of research on it over 10 years. We know that probiotics will help if you are on the autism spectrum. We know that they'll help if you have depression and we know that they'll help if you have schizophrenia. In terms of ASD, and this includes learning difficulties on the very low end um, and high functioning end of the spectrum like dyslexia, dyspraxia, uh, ADD and ADHD, it includes Asperger's and then it includes autism. We know that there is a 90, 90% overlap between ASD and gut disorders. This is what first got scientists to even think about like, whoa, is there something wrong with these people's guts? Well, yeah, there is. And one thing that our medical system Lots to do that really kind of breaks my heart is they're still very like into separating the gut and the brain. So these clients of mine would have their psychiatrist for their autism or their neurologist and then they have their gut doctor. But when you look at the science there's a 90% overlap. So something's clearly going wrong in the brain and in the gut. And we don't know what causes what but they're there in, in their patients together. And in fact, with autism spectrum, we see almost all of our clients have things like Crohn's colitis, IBS, um, celiac, like it's just they're suffering um, with their intestinal health. Interesting, but fun fact, scientists looked at um, the level of dysbiosis. You guys know what that word means? It means imbalance of good and bad, and uh, gut bacteria. And the more bad gut bugs that someone with autism spectrum disorders had, it predicted how severe their symptoms were. So a scientist, a blind scientist, that doesn't mean blind, like without sight, a blind means they don't know how sick the person was, was able to predict with accuracy how severe the ASD was based on the species, the bad gut bugs in that person's gut. So it's a correlation, I know. It's so crazy, but I'm thinking we're onto something with that one. With depression, uh, again, we see 
weird dysbiosis that you don't see in a healthy person. Um, many, many more bad gut bugs than good in, in the guts of somebody with depressive disorders. The other thing we see that's kind of scaring me right now with the research in depression is we're starting to see that in the blood of someone who is depressed, there are antibodies, so an immune reaction against bad gut bugs. What that means, and the reason I'm a little bit perplexed by this, is that means that potentially these bad gut bugs have left the gut and moved into the depressed person's brain. Like they've gone viral, like you know candida can do, and weird parasites and stuff can do. So um, yeah, so potentially these bad gut bugs are like, say, see ya, and moving out and going into the person's bloodstream. And then with schizophrenia, again, we see a similar dysbiosis, so an imbalance of the good and bad gut bacteria. Uh, so again, scientists are looking at what potentially could be going on there. Preclinically, the stuff that I'm most excited by that hopefully will turn to clinical in the next couple of years, so move from rodent to uh, human, include Alzheimer's, anxiety, and ALS, which stands for, it means Lou Gehrig's disease. The two other things that should be on my slide but aren't, this is very, very recent research, like the last couple of weeks I've been looking at, Parkinson's disease. It's not just genetic in everyone. It could in some people be environmental, and in some people could be related to their gut health. Um, and MS, multiple sclerosis. So those are two things. Those are less psychiatric, they're more like neurology, but again, like really, really interesting stuff coming out there in animal models so far, not in people yet. But, yeah. but because of, I'm seeing this, we're already putting our clients with PD and MS on, on the, this um, certain probiotic. We're gonna hold on to it, if you can remember. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. You have no choice. But I'm being polite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, is that okay? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, hold your questions if you can remember them. <laughs> Three oh, common issues. I didn't cheat. Three <laughs> common issues that science tells us probiotics can help with. Yeah, no one else raised their hand, actually. Okay, so do you know them? Mood, stress, and energy. Perfect. Congrats. Your prize is being at this talk. No, <laughs> her face just dropped. <laughs> and literally, like, that's not good enough. Um, you get my favorite golden milk. Uh, yeah, so congrats. We're out of prizes, so the third person's going to get an IOU from me after work when we migrate downstairs for Q&A, because I only brought two up. Yes? So, your answer. Mood, mood, stress, and energy are three common conditions that in an, even a healthy individual, probiotics in as little as four weeks can help. <laughs> okay, let's get rid of the science now. Well, still a little bit, stay with science. But let's move into our five rituals. And um, probiotics, of course, are going to be the first ritual that I hope you guys are, excuse me, already doing. But if not, start doing after tonight. We prescribe daily probiotic-rich foods to our clients anywhere from once a day to three times a day, even breakfast. If you're really sick, you're gonna be getting probiotics three times a day. Here are some of my and my team's favorite sources of probiotics. Uh, miso, tempeh, of course, kimchi, yogurt. Please buy plain unsweetened yogurt, please. Because if you're buying that delicious pre-sweetened stuff, I like it, it took me a while to get off it, then you can't be sure that what they're saying on the label about the active culture is actually in that product. Because those bugs have probably feasted on that delicious vanilla flavor, whatever, peach, and they're no longer viable, they're dead. So get it plain and add your own. You know, even if you're gonna add some like sugar, I'd rather you do that than buy the pre-sweetened stuff. Uh, real sourdough bread, people ask me like, what is real, what is unreal? Well, unreal, I learned the hard way, after spending 11 years in the medical field and not knowing any of this, unreal sourdough is when you flip the label and you learn to, you start looking and you see things like sourdough flavor. <laughs> you see that at standard grocery stores and so that's not real. Real sourdough needs to say active culture, probiotics, maybe even the strains, lactobacillus, on your label of your bread. Uh, that's real sourdough. Raw sauerkraut and other fermented veggies kefir, kombucha, and raw fermented salsa. These are some of your best sources of probiotics. Now, at Neurotrition, we do also work with supplements, and I'm proud to do that. I get asked this a lot, um, so I have an answer prepared. People ask me, you know, you're holistic. Why aren't you only about whole foods? 
And the first time I got asked that, I'm like, that's a great question. Um, but I've been asked it a lot over the seven year, last seven years. And the reason is, obviously, in my nutritionist training, we learn whole foods above all else. Whole foods, whole foods, whole foods. However, I came to nutrition a little bit later in my career. It's my second career. Um, my first career was neuroscience. And as a scientist, I'm trained to be looking at data. And what I'm looking for is at what dose of a certain supplement can I do good work and help my clients. Now, I don't know. I don't have an answer. Like, how many loaves of sourdough a day do I need to feed you? How many two liter tubs of yogurt do I need to feed you a day? I don't know for your ex, fill in the blank brain condition. I don't know, but I know what probiotic. I know what, you know, dose, one or two pills, if I can do the math on the, on the label. And that's why, you know, I'm proud. Like, yeah, whole foods obviously need to be the basis of anyone's, you know, brain and mental health kind of protocol. But I think when you're sick especially, or if you're at risk and you're worried, you need to supplement. Does that make sense? So uh, yeah, when you're supplementing with a probiotic, it's very trendy right now, so you need to be really careful. You need to get one that's third party tested, and that means you know someone outside of the company has come in and done the science and said it's legit. It's not someone that works for the company saying this is a good product. <laughs> um, you need to start with one, um, you need to take one that ideally starts with real whole foods. Most of them don't. Most of them are cheap and synthetic. So I work with Botanica and you know I promote, I love using and have all our patients on their Dr. Okiras. And this product starts with a bunch of different real whole foods, right? So you're already getting the whole foods part in, but it's packaged into a nice little convenient capsule. It starts with 92 different fruits and veggies. Um, and then it gets fermented for a super long time. And there's no other product on the market that's fermenting their probiotic for three to five years. So they've got two different formulations. Like, it's more expensive, but I always say it's worth it because it's three or five years. There's only a six buck difference between the two, so I say opt for the five year one. And in that five year, even three year, in that super long fermentation product process, a few things start to happen. These probiotics develop strength, and that's what I was talking about earlier. They get subjected to such variance in temperature that you can keep them in your purse. So this is the only brand that you don't need to refrigerate. So for someone like me that's traveling and busy, I'm like, oh, when am I gonna get to a hotel to refrigerate my pills? Now they're dead, like throw them out because I didn't get to a fridge in time. This one can go with you in your fridge, in your purse. Um, you don't need to worry because it doesn't need that like cold, cold. This one also, I'm a coffee drinker. I have from from time to time known to swig it back. Don't judge. I come from the medical. I don't come from holistic like you guys. Um, yeah. So yeah. And also, we were talking about those short chain fatty acids a little while ago. In this product, because it's been three to five years that these gut bugs have been hanging out together in this capsule, they poofed a lot. So they have these compounds in the pill, these are compounds that can help regulate things like our weight and our hunger. So, I mean, yeah, and there's prebiotics in there, because we'll learn next, our second ritual prebiotics are a lot of your fruits and veg, it's already in that one pill. So you're getting three different things, a little tertiary, three different things for your, for your money. Now, prebiotics are the new big thing um, in nutrition, and I worry that, again, they're becoming very trendy, so people are just using the word and slapping prebiotic on a label, and the front of labels in North America isn't regulated. So I worry that this word is starting to show up. So I just wanted to teach you what does it actually mean to be a prebiotic. And to a scientist, it means three things. It means that it needs to go through your entire GI tract and not get digested. It needs to make it to your colon intact. It then needs to get eaten fermented by your gut bugs, and then it needs to be shown scientifically to stimulate the number and activity of the good gut bugs. So this is what it means to be a real prebiotic. And the good news is, a ton of your foods have been proven to be real prebiotics, so that's nice. So again, these are your whole foods, and I won't go through the whole list, but hopefully you're already eating a lot of them. Some are more delicious than others, okay, like <laughs> raw cacao. <laughs> versus raw leaf, but you know, you can get creative with all of these. In terms of, and again, we recommend our clients need to eat these anywhere at least from once, not all of them, but choosing, you know, two, three from the list every day, one to three times a day. In terms of a supplement, the Dr. O'Hara's, I love it because it has the prebiotic in there, so I don't need my clients to take another pill. 
because that's no fun. So I was trying to limit, like, how many birds can I kill with one stone? What product can I put you on that oh, you only need one or two products? You don't need, like, your whole, like, some people show up uh, for their first appointment with me and they're, like, dumping out a backpack. Like, that's too expensive, it's not realistic, and it's just, yeah. So you want to just take a few key things that are smart. Um, one thing to note, one of the guys on my science council out at the Hotchkiss Brain Institute at University of Calgary, he studies leaky gut. He studies intestinal <laughs> permeability <laughs> syndrome. Um, yeah. So anyway, and he and I were having a conversation about prebiotics, because I, I was telling him that I partnered with Botanica, and he was saying, cool, because what he's starting to see in his human populations is the synthetic cheap prebiotic called FOS, fructose oligosaccharides, that you'll see in the cheaper probiotics added to it people are going off the probiotic because it's making them bloated and farty. So he's like, okay, if there's something that's naturally occurring prebiotic, that will be better for patients than this cheapy FOS right now that's on the market. So. Now, we've talked about probiotics, we've talked about prebiotics, but if you are sick or you're worried about getting sick, um, you're gonna need a bit more support. So stress and inflammation are probably the two biggest silent killers in our part of the world. Have you guys heard that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people don't know really like what does stress look like, or I'm not stressed, but it's taking a toll on their body, or I'm not inflamed, what does inflammation look like? Well, it looks different in everyone. What we do know from the research is that our microbiome actually helps regulate our stress response. And it does that by helping um, regulate something called the HPA axis, which stands for hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal axis. And so when your microbiome is healthy, it helps create a healthy HPA axis so that you can deal with stress better and not sweat the small stuff. When your microbiome is unhealthy, we see that your HPA axis is shot and you can't cope with even the smallest stressor. So this is really significant. And we've looked at, um, not me personally, but I've read research, looking at certain populations that have very high stress. People like nurses, people, other individuals who work shift work, airline pilots and other airline crew, their HPA axis is just shot. So again, I wonder, you know, when I get these guys and gals as clients, what can I do to help them fuel their gut and help their gut brain axis and their HPA axis? A couple years ago, we discovered that the gut bugs help um, regulate something called your microglia. So you've all probably heard of neurons. These are our main brain cells. But there's little helper brain cells that don't really get much attention. These are called the uh, microglia. And these are starting to get attention because these special secondary uh, brain cells help control neuroinflammation. This is becoming big in neuroscience because we're starting to link neuroinflammation to things like depression and then to things like Alzheimer's. So we need to make sure if we have neuroinflammation, we better try and nip it in the bud. One way that we can get neuroinflammation is we, if we get a concussion, even like a low grade mild concussion, it starts this little blip of neuroinflammation. And if we don't target it, if we don't treat it and calm it down, it's shown to spread. And then the more concussions you get, that neuroinflammation gets bigger and bigger and all of a sudden you're at risk for depression or Alzheimer's. So that's how that happens. And uh, yeah, the microbiome helps regulate this stuff, so very cool. <laughs> I've had a few concussions, so I'm worried. <laughs> okay, so ritual three has to be about calming inflammation, whether systemic in your body or neuro in your brain. So we prescribe anti-inflammatory foods, herbs and spices, and we de-prescribe, which is probably a fake word, but oh well, we're going to de-prescribe the bad stuff, the stuff that promotes inflammation and the non-foods. These are your processed, refined non-foods. Um, our most anti-inflammatory foods include our green leafy veg, obviously, uh, brightly colored fruits, raw nuts and seeds, plant-based milks. I'm not a big fan of milk milk anymore. Uh, fatty fish, some of the best fatty fish for brain and gut include things like wild salmon, uh, black cod, halibut, trout, the little fish like mackerel, anchovy, sardine, the more economical fish. Um, but you can still make them taste delicious. We've got lots of recipes on our website, neurochristian.ca, and then, um, yeah. Uh, gay meats are actually found to be anti-inflammatory, which is awesome because I live in Calgary now and there's peer pressure to eat red meat. 
um, when I moved there, I had stayed like once in my life. And then my new friends were like, oh boy, she's from DC. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to try it. But of course, I like go home. I'm like, oh my god, what have I eaten? I researched. So the good news is the game here meets like bison, for example, are shown to actually be anti-inflammatories. Okay, good. So anti-inflammatory red meat, um, herbs and spices, and then healthy fats. In terms of supplementing, turmeric is all the rage these days. You've all probably heard of it. Um, now, the research on it has shifted a little bit over the last three or four years. When I first started um, the company seven years ago, I hadn't really heard of turmeric. So about four or five years ago, I started recommending turmeric to our clients. And I was recommending only curcumin. Curcumin is the active compound found in turmeric. And I thought, great, I'm doing a good job. Well, uh, about a year or two ago, the research shifted. And what it's starting to suggest now is you don't only need curcumin because there's other compounds in the whole root turmeric called curcuminoids <laughs> that help curcumin actually be absorbed into your body and brain better. So it doesn't work as well to just have the isolated curcumin powder. You actually need the whole root turmeric. So again, some cooler, smarter companies are starting to monopolize on that. Botanica just came out with this golden milk and they're crushing up the whole turmeric root. So you're getting the curcuminoids, right? Um, it's awesome, it also gives you a little bit of ashwagandha, which is an herb for nervous system support. It's not at a medicinal um, therapeutic dose, so you don't need to worry about it interacting if you're on any anti-anxiety meds or anything. But a nice little low dose to take the edge off. I really like to have the golden milk before I go to bed. So uh, yeah, it's become one of my daily rituals since working with the company. And uh, yeah, there's black pepper in there, because you may have heard piperine. And black pepper increases the bioavailability of curcumin by 150 fold. So you need turmeric, you need to like, yeah, make sure that any turmeric supplement you take has that pepper in it. Um, and then Botanica also gives you cinnamon in theirs, which is really cool for blood sugar support and balance if you struggle with like cravings or emotional eating, that'll really help you out. Um, they sweeten it with dates, because again, golden milks are very cool right now, so I've looked at a lot, and why is there sugar? Like, you're trying to do something good for your health, why are they sweetened with sugar? So this one's just using medjool dates, which is nice, and lower glycemic. Um, and then there's also a bit of coconut in there, so a bit of protein, um, and prebiotics as well. So overall, a really cool, like, superior product there. But I think they're sampling it downstairs after. <laughs> I said you're the good kind of fat. Yeah, I don't want you guys to raise hands. I was going to say raise your hands if you're still scared of fat, but I'm sure people would be like nervous. But I'm here to tell you don't be scared of fat. A lot of research out there is showing like if you eat healthy fats, you're more likely to be slimmer than people who are still following the low fat uh, trend that I was, I'm just still waiting for it to die out. But I still see clients from time to time who are still so scared. And they're like, Orsha, like we want to trust you, but it's just ingrained. We're scared to eat fat. Um, some of the research I've looked at, this is in women, so sorry for men in here, I have not seen studies in men, but a quarter cup of raw nuts and seeds a day in women is going to significantly improve your weight management. And women who eat a quarter cup at least of raw nuts and seeds a day are significantly on average slimmer than their counterparts who are following low fat. And that's just your waistline, that you know doesn't even tie into your brain and mental health. Like I've seen what clients look like on a fat free diet, it's not, it's not pretty. Science says healthy fats will help you fight stress. Now that's cool. Help you kind of dampen the effects that stress will have on your body and brain. And healthy fats can fight inflammation. In fact, and this is really cool, because this is one of the reasons I was able to confidently forge ahead and create my company. The science on omega-3 fats, quite possibly, is the reason that neuroscience and nutrition even intersected in the late 80s. Before that, they hated each other. They like didn't even care. They never thought they'd be you know, ever working together. But late 80s, scientists saw that, holy moly, people who eat more fish tend to be less depressed. And then they started measuring people's blood and people's pee, and they're like, whoa, the more omega fats in there, these people aren't as depressed. Like, what's going on? It's just a correlation. Um, you can still be depressed and eat plenty of fats. But it was one correlation in the late 80s that uh, kind of brought these two together. So I'm just piggybacking off the fact that they talk and get along now. So ritual four has to be healthy fats. And by healthy fats, I'm talking about things like coconut oil and extra virgin olive oil, uh, butter, ghee, which is a clarified uh, butter, flax, hemp, and chia seed oils. But the one thing to note here is healthy fats can turn on you real fast if you're doing a few things incorrectly with them. If you're not storing them properly and if you're not using them properly, they turn on you. 
So in terms of storing the fats, especially the really um, delicate ones like extra virgin olive oil and these ones, you need to store them ideally in a really small, dark glass bottle. And that's because they're so delicate, they're kind of weak, they're so delicate they get damaged real fast by things like light or air. So anytime you're opening you know, the bottle or exposing them to any of those elements. Now, I know that the small dark glass bottles are expensive, so the way we work around that with our clients is we get them to buy it in bigger ones, but then they go to the dollar store or Ikea and buy those small dark bottles and at home immediately transfer it. So that's one way you can get around it, but get it out of those big, cheap, clear plastic bottle immediately. Now, in terms of cooking, high heat, you want to stick to the things that are solid at room temperature, the saturated ones. Uh, coconut oil, butter, and ghee. And then low to medium heat, you can do with your olive oil and no heat with these ones. These ones are so delicate, like you don't want to turn them into nasty, kind of toxic fats. Supplementing, uh, for all our clients at Neurotrition, if there's any evidence of a mental health issue, they get put on fish oil. This is where the research started back in the 80s, so this is probably the strongest area, um, in my opinion, for mental health, and that is specifically two omega-3s, EPA and DHA. Now, you can. some people will ask me, like, well, can I supplement with flax um, to get my omega-3? Well, you can. Um, however, the omega-3 found in flax or chia or hemp is called ALA, alpha-linolenic acid, and that requires a conversion into EPA and DHA. And what research tells us is that up to 80% of us, for whatever reason, can't make that conversion very well. So while all those good those seeds are amazing and the oils are amazing, but if you're needing help for your brain and your microbiome, you need EP and DHA, so you want a fish oil. If you're allergic or you're vegan, then you want an algae that gives you EP and DHA. So there's solutions, yeah, for sure. And if you don't want algae, then you can take a flax oil, but you also need to take a multivitamin to increase your chances of conversion because that conversion from the ALA and EPA needs so many vitamins and minerals that I believe we're depleted in, so we're not converting it. So those are your three options. Um, Botanica's got a really cool one called Omega Licious because it actually tastes good. Most of them, I'm like, they taste so gross. And um, it also doesn't coat your tongue and have that like nasty kind of schlacky mouthfeel because they use a really cool, expensive, but cool process called emulsification. So not only does that kind of make it taste better and not feel so like, like full on oil in your mouth. Emulsification helps make the EP and DHA more bioavailable, so it actually gets into your cells better. So uh, pretty uh, smart product there. And then the last thing uh, we switched to uh, from nutrition or from diets and supplement, the last thing I want to talk about is something in the lifestyle modality, and that is mindfulness. And you know, when I started this company, I never ever thought I'd be talking about this stuff. I considered it very hokey, hocus pocus, and now I just, yeah, I love it. New research is coming out almost every day on the benefit of mindfulness. And specifically with respect to your brain and mental health, literally it's being shown to rewire the brain um, in certain key areas of the brain, um, in the prefrontal cortex, in the hippocampus, and in the amygdala. What we're seeing in the prefrontal cortex, so that's like the very front part of your brain that makes you human and makes us think we're smarter than other animals. We have this huge PFC that other animals don't have. And this PFC is great because we can have deep thoughts and deep conversations but also it kind of like in many people turns people bad, right? Like because we have this ability to just overthink things or to use our big PFCs not for good. But what mindfulness does is very interesting. As little as two weeks of just like a free mindfulness app, okay? Like you don't need to move to Tibet unless you want to and go into the ashram. You don't need to. You can stay here and just do basic mindfulness training. A couple weeks is shown to increase the gray matter in your prefrontal cortex. It's also shown to increase compassion for yourself and others. A little as two weeks. Um, it's shown to improve your pain tolerance, which is lovely because pain is so difficult to treat, whether you're trying to do it with meds, like chronic pain, or you're trying to do it naturally. Chronic pain is very difficult, and we think mindfulness doesn't make pain go away, but it makes it more bearable. It makes it more manageable. So that's really, really wonderful. 
hippocampus is the part of your brain that has to deal with memory. This is the part that shrinks in AD, in Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of work is looking at like, wow, mindfulness can actually improve gray matter. So maybe as we age and we you know, start to develop risk factors for dementia and that hippocampus starts to shrink, could mindfulness keep the hippocampus big? That would be amazing. And then the amygdala, one of my favorite parts of the brain, that's where your fight or flight lives. That's where your ability to kind of get stressed and outrun someone scary or something scary or fight it lives. And in many of our clients who deal with anxiety and anxiety disorders, the amygdala is way too overactive, like not in a healthy way. Do you know what I mean? They're being stressed all the time with things like generalized anxiety disorder or social phobia or PTSD. The amygdala is just always on. And what we're seeing mindfulness can do is mindfulness starts to cut the connection, but in a good way, not like scary, cutting your brain. It starts to weaken the connection between your amygdala and your prefrontal cortex so that people who deal with anxiety, when they get stressed, if they're more mindful, the amygdala reacts less and the PSC reacts more. So what that looks like is the next time someone's PTSD gets a flashback, they potentially, after practicing mindfulness, get less fearful but are able to use that big PSC and be like, it's going to be okay. And that's huge. Um, yeah, so I believe mindfulness has power that even food and supplements don't. One of the big things we see, for example, in depression is this aspect of rumination. If any of you have dealt with depression, it's rumination or perseveration. It's just this chronic, negative voice that won't stop. And rumination is the number one risk factor that you will develop major depression. So this is no joke. If you're having that constant negative chatter, that's the number one risk factor we see for depression. And unfortunately, meds don't touch that and nutrition doesn't. The only thing that helps with uh, that rumination is mindfulness so far. So yeah, I'm proud to talk about something I used to consider very, yeah, flaky because it's helping things that the meds or the food can't. And then most recently, this study just completed a few weeks ago, so this is fresh off the press, of the first clinical trial to show that mindfulness changes your gut microbiome. So this is nuts where the research is headed. So in this study, they took patients with IBS or IBD, irritable bowel syndrome or disease, and they gave them, I think, four to six weeks of basic mindfulness training. And what they saw is after just a couple weeks of this training, these IBS, IBD patients reported less symptoms, less stress, and I'm saving the last for, the, the best for last. There was a noted difference in their gene expression. Their genetic expression, coding for markers that had to do with inflammation, which is like the big thing with IBS and IBD, was reduced. So that was pretty crazy to read, that mindfulness could actually be altering gene expression. Um, yeah, so I'm super excited, because I feel like this, this area is gonna just take off now, because that was just the first study. Got published in time for the tour. So, ritual five, mindfulness. Here are some of the things that you want to start thinking about um, incorporating. Again, if you want to move to an ashram for a year, go for it. But something like this can also help. Connecting with your breath, eating mindfully. A lot of research looking at mindful eating these days. Walking mindfully, observing your thoughts and emotions, and pausing before you act, as well as just choosing something that you love to do and getting lost in the flow. Many of us have so, since we're kids, we don't do that anymore. Even though we're doing something pleasurable, we're always thinking about something else, right? Like, so this is hard. Um, it's tough to get into a habit of mindfulness. I, to be honest with you, I struggle with this, I'm new to this, but once you get it, you just start noticing the benefits. So I encourage you to just start with one and then work your way through the list. So yeah, we force our clients to get mindful. They're like, I thought we are coming to like a neuro company. Like, what are we talking about? I'm like, do it. <laughs> it works. Mm -hmm. Pop quiz. Three prebiotic foods. Someone in the back. I feel like you guys need to be included. Yeah. Prebiotic. Prebiotic. I'm going to give you a second chat. So prebiotic. So this is the food for your probiotics. Mm -hmm. Sweet potato. Kale. Kale. And nuts. Nuts. Yeah. Awesome. So you get my IOU. So we'll go downstairs and get a product after. <laughs> So here's our summary to wrap the evening with before we go into the Q&A. 
I've taught you that your gut and your brain are talking to one another all the time. <laughs> when they stop talking, bad things happen. We talked about leaky gut and we talked about leaky brain. And then we really moved into these beautiful rituals that form the core at Neurotrition of what we're doing with our clients to focus on their brain and mental health. We talked about probiotics and prebiotics through whole foods and through good quality supplementation. We talked about anti-inflammatory eating and additional support. We talked about the turmeric, uh, the healthy fats, and then last but not least, the mindfulness. So, Thank you so much. That brings us to a close of me speaking. Thank you very much.